Welcome to all of you. Uh, tonight's lecture is the first of the College of Nurses Nursing 17th Annual Health and Human Values Lecture Series, Promoting Dignity Through Local and Public Health. We're grateful for the generous support of a grant from the Johnson & Johnson family of companies. Health disparities refer to differences between groups of people in terms of how frequently a disease affects a group, how many people get sick, or how often the disease causes death. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Calvin B. Johnson, is a former Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and former Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for the Temple University Health System in Philadelphia. He is currently the founder and president of Altre Strategic Solutions Group, which provides strategic consulting regarding healthcare policy and practice and public health and health service delivery. With a background of practice, service, and government, combined with his national leadership roles, uh, Dr. Johnson brings a unique perspective to the conversation on communities and health disparities. He's also a board-certified pediatrician, a graduate of the Johns Hopkins Medical School in both medicine and public health, as well as an undergraduate degree he has from Morehouse in Atlanta, Georgia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Calvin Johnson as he offers us his thoughts this evening about health disparities. Thank you. Good evening. Wow, look at this. <laughs> Standing room only, got the aisles filled up. I might be impressed if I didn't know you were required to be here. <laughs> so, what we're going to talk about um, for the next, oh, I don't know, how much time do you have? A couple hours? Fantastic. Um, for the next few minutes or so is something that is so real that you can feel it, so real you can see it, so real that for many people it'll kill you. We're talking about disparities. Disparities in health, disparities in health care. Now I know many of you know much about this and so during the course of this or at the end of it, however you want to play it, we can discuss, you can share what you know. I always take away something whenever I have a chance to, to talk about this issue with groups. So I expect to take away something from this and learn something new as well. Um, but the fact is, that it's real. But probably the most important fact, at least in my view, the most important fact is that it doesn't have to be. And a companion fact to that is we can do something about it. We can eliminate health disparities. Now, that's not a statement for those of you who are the technical listeners or the detail folks, and you, know, you could argue that point all day. You'll never eliminate health disparities. Of course, well, you're right, because cervical cancer, there will always be a disparity, right? Why? Gender, okay? To my knowledge, To my knowledge, <laughs> there is no way that I can get <laughs> cervical cancer. Prostate cancer, there'll always be a disparity. Why? Who wants to, who wants to piggyback on that one? That's an easy one? There are a few gimmies that I throw out there. I don't throw out a whole lot. There are a few out there. Who wants to take that one? Gender. Gender. Good answer. There you go. All right. To my knowledge, to my knowledge, you will never get prostate cancer. Okay? So there's some disparities we'll never address. But the disparities, the disparities that do exist 
in many shapes and forms, we can do something about. And it is almost criminal. In fact, sometimes it is criminal, I would argue, that we haven't or we don't. <clears throat> is this the first time anyone has seen this quote? And it's okay if you have. There's no value judgments here. This is, this is so basic and so powerful to me. This quote was given, and I used to know the date exactly. Forgive me for not preparing or remembering that date before I came in here to see you. The 1960s. Anyone know where? City? Come on, with confidence. No. <laughs> but I like your confidence. No, this is, this is really not a, that important a fact, but we're going to play. <laughs> Chicago, Illinois. Chicago, I know, was, I was about to say that, right? Chicago, Illinois, in front of a group of physicians that had formed, and this was their first national congress or convention, and this group of physicians had formed for one reason. It was to support the civil rights movement in particular the civil rights workers who were traveling down into the Deep South and were sitting at counters, marching, going into neighborhoods and rural areas to register folks to vote, and were putting themselves at great danger, physical danger. And to support these civil rights workers who oftentimes, if and when they got injured, would be refused medical care at the local hospitals or by the local physicians and probably some nurses too. So this group formed, and then nurses joined as well, they formed to go down there as well and be on the ready to support and provide medical care and support to these civil rights workers. And so this was their meeting where this quote was made by Dr. King. And it's so right. But yet disparities exist. And again, disparities exist despite the fact that there's so much we can do about them. And disparities aren't, it, it's, a, it's an umbrella term. And it includes gender, as we just talked about. Race and ethnicity, probably the one of the most predominant ones we hear talked about, racial and ethnic disparities. And when people hear health disparities, many folks just automatically revert to that definition, racial and ethnic. <clears throat> one that for so many years was elusive and pushed to the side as not really being real. That's just a figment of your imagination. But you know what? Clearly documented now. Clearly documented over and over and over again. And one of the greatest places to start, I think, for someone who craves that documentation, that verifying the truth, is in the Institute of Medicine's report, Unequal Treatment. And then you can just keep going from there. But they also exist in terms of education and income, disability, geographic location, where you live matters. Where you live, there are health and health care differences, disparities between folks who live in urban areas or rural areas. And you know what? It's not always what you think. It's both and back and forth. It can switch. There are some areas where in rural America, rural Pennsylvania, where the disparity shows an increased burden of disease, or decrease access, and you can flip it in their areas where in urban America, urban Pennsylvania, that the disparity is seen there, a greater burden of disease seen there. But there is a difference. And of course, sexual, sexual orientation is one as well. So there are many, and this is just a partial list, <clears throat> but it's not something new. Disparity in health care is not, it gets a whole lot of play now, 
And I'm grateful and thankful that it does because it gets us talking about it, gets us having courses on it, it gets us coming to mandatory lectures. <laughs> but it's not real. I mean, excuse me, it's not new. It's not new. In 1932, there's a group of 600 men who were told by the United States government that if they enrolled in an important study, that they would get free health care, among other things including, including a guaranteed burial plot. Now I know some of you are thinking, it'll take a little bit more than that for me to sign on. Burial plot just isn't kind of in my top 10, top 10 list of remuneration, right? You want to check, cash, credit card, iPhone, iPod, Something that you can use now, right? Not something down the line. But you know what? In 1932, for these black men in Tuskegee, Alabama, a burial pot and free health care was worth more than all those kinds of things. Because if they didn't get it free, they had to find a way to pay for it. And they didn't have health insurance. So if they needed health care, then that meant that that was something that they could not use or pay for to provide for their family. The idea of a burial plot was something that you absolutely had to have. I mean, that's, that's the way you spend or where you spend eternity, at least your earthly self. But if it wasn't given to you, you had to pay for it, and it wasn't cheap. And that was a burden on families. And so to offer these men a burial plot for free, to them, that was a burden they could lift right off of their families. If I'm gone and not here to earn money, my family doesn't have to worry about that. So you offer these men, these 600 men, something like that, they're jumping at it. Those folks who offered it pretty much knew that, right? I suspect. 600 men, 200 and, uh, or 399 of them, check my math. 399 of them, cases, 201, controls. Is that 300? 600, I mean? It's your question. <laughs> yeah. The cases were men with syphilis. Bad blood, as it was called. The controls. The controls were men <clears throat> who would not be treated. Okay, also with syphilis. And what happened? Well, for the next six months, they were told, they would be monitored. Those in the case group would be given medication. Those in the controls would not. I flipped that, I'm sorry. And then the idea was ultimately to understand what the effects or the natural pathophysiology of this disease was, which in 1932 had treatments, some brutal treatments, but no cure. So for six months they were going to do this. Well, six months turned into 40 years. And what happened in the course of those 40 years with respect to syphilis? Not just a treatment, but a, well, it was a treatment, but also a cure. Cure. Something called penicillin. So not only a cure, but a cheap cure, too. Did these men get it? No, these men didn't get it. So that at least 28 of them, at least 28 of them, actually more than that, I'm sorry, died directly of complications of syphilis. A number of their wives were infected. At least 19 of their children were born with congenital syphilis. So this was something that didn't just start and end right there in that generation. It carried on. It carried on. Interestingly enough, 
when it broke in 1972 in the New York Times, that article you saw there, well, it actually didn't really break in the New York Times on that date. It actually broke the evening before in a, Washington, in a newspaper that's no longer in existence in Washington, D.C. by this reporter who found this out, printed it. By the next morning, when the New York Times carried the cover, it was all over. It was all over. Because f people were reading something that was hard to believe. So here you had, right there in black and white, in front of you, tangible, you could feel it, healthcare disparity. Healthcare disparity. Where else could this or would something like this happen? How could it happen? How could it happen here? <clears throat> well, it did happen here, and it's not the first place that it happened. It's not the last time that it happened. In the course of all that, this happened as well. This is, it's written up there, <laughs> Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks is known now by most folks, known for the HeLa cells, the Henrietta Lacks HeLa cells, that probably everyone in this room, everyone in this room, if you haven't used or done an experiment with, at least learned about in a science class. Cells that were taken from her body while she was being ravaged with cervical cancer, taken and put in a culture and grown. And they've grown. And they've grown and grown and continued. The first known immortal human cell line that her family didn't know about until recently, that she never knew about because she died eight months after she was diagnosed in 1951 of cervical cancer at the age of 31. Okay. Taken care of at Johns Hopkins Hospital, where I learned about HeLa cells. Disparity, once again, real, real. And then, for us, who are the science folks, who relish data, it's still just as real. What are we looking at here? Breast cancer in Pennsylvania. Breast cancer in Pennsylvania over time. Okay, so trend data. Looking at breast cancer among three racial and ethnic groups. Asian Pacific Islander population, African American, black population, and the white or Caucasian population in Pennsylvania. The incidence of breast cancer. And what do we notice about this? We notice that, and this is, let's look at it qualitatively. Don't worry so much about quantitatively in the numbers. But qualitatively, what do we see? Well, we see that one, this kind of looks funky probably because there just wasn't a whole lot of data gathered, certainly not before now around Asian Pacific Islanders. Another reason or example of disparity just wasn't gathered. But then also, numbers can be very small sometimes, and when you know when you have small numbers, looking at population data, it doesn't always give you useful numbers, and, and small changes can produce very wide variations or swings in terms of looking at it graphically. But let's concentrate on these two lines right here. And what do you notice about those lines? They look fairly similar, don't they? Fairly similar, all right? The rate's too high, of course, but they look fairly similar. Over time, the incidence has been, okay, pretty, pretty close. So the, actually, for most of that time, from 1990 to 2008, that the incidence of breast cancer among white Pennsylvanians, and this is all women, this is female population here, was greater than that among the African American female population, right? Okay, got that? All right. So then what do we see here? What are we looking at there? This is a graph showing us what? Death. So the first one was showing us incidence, right? Diagnosis, new occurrences of this disease. This one shows us death. What do you notice about this? Those lines aren't right together anymore, are they? All right, remember in that first one? 
Who for most of that, what's that, a 10, almost 20 year period? You're my math major, right? You're not going to talk to me about math, are you? All right. For most of that 18 year period, who had the higher incidence? White females, right? When you look at this, for that entire 18 year period, who has the highest death rate? And not by just a little. It's going to take more than that to get me to stop. <laughs> All right. So the death rate is higher for those with the lower incidence. How can that happen? How can that happen? Well, part of the answer is in the title of this talk. Disparity, right? Disparity. Well, while the incidence may have been higher for white females, the death rate is higher for black females because of later diagnosis, meaning it wasn't found until it was much further along, harder to treat, often more aggressive. Why wasn't it found? Well, there's all kinds of reasons for that. Access to care. Those same African American women may not have had the same access to care, may not have been able to say, I feel a lump in my breast. Well, I'm sorry. I feel a lump in my breast. Let me get to see my doctor and are sitting in front of their doctor within a week. They may not have a doctor. They may not have a phone. And so you know what? It's not stopping me from doing what I need to do every day. So I'll just keep on going until sometimes that that breast is so grotesque in terms of its appearance because of the way that the cells have been changed and deformed and that cancer has grown out till they say something's so wrong I can't wait any longer. They go to an emergency room and that is their entrance point into health care. At that point what you see on the outside is only part of that cancer. That cancer isn't in the breast anymore. It's spread to the lungs, it's spread to the bones, it's spread to the brain, and it results in death, a disparity, a disparity. Asthma. <clears throat> Deaths from asthma. Now, how many, how many people in here have asthma? You don't have to share if you don't want to. I mean, it's a, it can be a privacy issue. All right. I would suspect that while those of you who, who may have a diagnosis of asthma know how serious it is, know how serious it can be. But I suspect probably most of you who have asthma in here do not think of it on a regular basis, and I'm trying to choose my words correctly so you get my point, on a regular basis, as truly life-threatening as truly life-threatening. And I don't mean to minimize it, but I suspect that your asthma, in most cases, is probably managed, controlled. You know the signs and symptoms. You have the medications that you need, both for the chronic management and the acute management. And so it's, it's, it's something that you can live, that you control, that you can take care of, and that every day is not is not a fatalistic thought day for you around your asthma, I suspect. But for many people, that's not the case. One, they may not understand the disease. Two, they don't have anything to help control that disease. And certainly in an acute exacerbation, they have minimal means to address it or address it quickly. And so asthma for still many people is a fatal disease. Now, asthma is serious. There's no question about it. But then you look here and you look at these two groups in Pennsylvania, and you see, in some cases, a four to five times fold difference in terms of death. Death rates, risk of death, likelihood of death for the same disease, disparity. 
<clears throat> prostate cancer. Okay. I think you get my point. Right? So again, it's real. And it's complicated. It's complicated. You like to think that if it was an easy solution, it would have been taken care of by now, right? You like to think that. This is neither easy solutions for disparity or actions and intentional actions to address disparities. It's not easy, nor is it necessarily popular. So, so what I do when I come out and talk, I'm trying to build that army, that force, those folks of action, intention and action to flip that script so that it becomes much more popular, so it becomes much more intentional. Intentional among people who are prone to action. But let's unfold some of that complication, right? Because you've got to understand it. To, to do it right and fix it, you've got to understand it. So health disparity isn't just about see a doctor, see a nurse, you're good. It's not that simple, is it? It's not that simple. Because if that were the case, Villanova would just educate more nurses, send you out there, and you would save the world and fix all this mess. That's what you're going to do anyway, I know. But they send you out faster. All right? And you target on this. No, it's much more complicated than that. We know that there are social determinants. You've heard that term, right? Social determinants that play a role here. Social factors that determine, help determine health outcomes, health issues. One of those is something that gets talked about so much, one of the hottest political topics today, right? Always is every election, and we're heading into that time again. Always. What's that? I'm glad you're a vocal group. Right. <laughs> right. It makes me feel like I'm not here by myself. That light went out. I felt like I was all alone in here, people. <laughs> talk. Let's talk to me. Education, right? Education. We know, because again, it's been documented. This is, I mean, this is not new stuff. Education correlates to health care. There are correlations. So what does this show us? This shows us that if you have a college education, if you have a college education, all right, you are more likely, more likely as a mother, mothers with college educations are more likely to have children that live, oh, I'm sorry, that live past the first year of life, infant mortality. If you do not, if you have less than a high school education, you're almost twice as likely as a mother to have a child that dies in the first year of life. Okay? And it's a very clear gradient by educational level and experience. So education. This information comes from uh, a Robert Wood Johnson funded um, group um, out of the Center for Social Disparities in Health out of the University of California, but also part of um, a broader effort that that they have, that I have a few more slides from, that really spoke to and addressed those social determinants of health and showed in a very clear and I think powerful way how this stuff all plays together. And we'll talk a little bit more later about why I'm focusing on all these pieces. Because I believe that in all these pieces is the solution. <clears throat> So just in case you were thinking that it was just about education, it's not. It's not. Education is linked with health, absolutely. And we see that across racial and ethnic groups. But we also see within racial and ethnic groups that education plays a factor. So what is this showing us? Well, this is showing us, if we look here, that again, this is less than high school education here. College graduates are here. If you look across, let's just, take, let's just take the less than high school graduates across all racial and ethnic groups. Here, 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 and here. All right? What you see is that <clears throat> across racial and ethnic groups, 
poor education, or less education, I should say, because we're not talking quality of education, we're talking about years of education here. Quality of education can add a whole other layer to this. Years of education, you see, very different than those who are or have experienced more education, college level education. Then you look within groups, within racial and ethnic groups, you see that gradient again, and then you see that this, this carries across racial and ethnic lines. That there's other complicated stuff here because if you look at the non-white Hispanics, they in this group, well, it's, while it's close in that, in that less than high school age group, still the non-white Hispanics tend to have a, a lower percent of adults who claim that they're in less than good health. Okay, I know it's a funny way to say it. It's just saying, this is all self-report. As folks, are you in good, fair, poor, whatever health? And they group them together. If you say, I'm, I'm, if you don't pick the, I'm in good to very good health, then you're in less than good health. So you're in that bottom group in terms of your self-reported health status. <clears throat> and regardless, with that lower education, across racial lines, you still see that disparity between non-whites and other racial and ethnic groups. You see it even more pronounced, actually, as you go up in education, interestingly enough. Look at this, look at the college-educated black non-Hispanics and the college-educated Hispanics versus the college-educated white non-Hispanics. More than one and a half times difference in terms of their self-reported health status. There's something complicated and layered going on here, okay? Social determinants of health. Complicated and layered, but not impossible to figure out, all right? And then, I just want to point this out on the slide before we leave it. Then you look and you say, but look, if this is the national benchmark to determine where we could be in terms of health, hey, guess what? I don't care if you're white, black, Hispanic, Asian American, none of us are meeting that. None of us are as healthy as we could and should be, all right? None of us are as healthy as we could and should be. So in fact, <clears throat> so in fact, there are health issues for all of us. Well, let's talk about income as well. But well, we know that education and income are correlated, right? That's why you all are still in school now because you don't want to be poor, right? You could have quit this mess a long time ago if that didn't matter to you, beside the fact that you want to save the world and you love what you do. We know that education is correlated with higher levels of income. But we also know that health varies by income as well. So here we're looking at this green here is less than 100% of poverty level, okay? And this here, is greater than 400% of poverty level in terms of income. So higher income on this end, lower income on this end. And what do you see? That when you look again at those who are reporting poor to fair health, you have a higher percentage of those who have lower income reporting poorer health than you do higher income. And then you look at that across racial and ethnic groups, and you see the same thing. Now this is a kind of a correlate to that other slide where you look across the racial and ethnic groups. Within the, it doesn't matter within the groups. Within each racial and ethnic group, you see the same thing happening. So it's not just if you're black, you're more likely to be in poorer health, and if you're white, you're more likely to be in better health. Yeah, in the big picture, yeah, but then you look within these groups. This is the better health group, and you look within that group, and income is correlated with that. Poor, lower income, Worse health, higher income, better health, a phenomenon you see in each racial group because of social factors that play a role in there. I'm going to skip that one tonight. I'm going to get to one of my absolute favorite slides. <clears throat> this is a map, if you will, of greater Philadelphia area, kind of the five county area. Right now, we sit. Ooh, somewhere right about here, right? We're kind of right on that Montgomery County, Delaware County, not all that far from Chester County line, right? 
And so what does this show us? This is showing us life expectancy, all right? And this is from, again, that group of, of Robert Wood Johnson work for that, um, that supported the commission to build a, a healthier America, where they looked at these social determinants of health. And so it says where you live actually matters. Well, tonight, folks, aren't you glad that you live right around here somewhere? Because <laughs> what does that show you? It shows you that out here, the, expected, the life expectancy is all around 70, eight, almost 80 years, okay? There's nobody in this room anywhere close to that. So you've got a long time, a lot of fruitful years ahead of you. But you know what? Travel a few miles east, and where do you end up? Right? Everybody's been to 30th Street Station, right? And the neighborhood's right around there, Mantua, all right, parts of West Philadelphia there. Look at that difference in terms of the years of life expectancy. Just a few miles difference. Why is that? Why could that be? Why could that be? Anybody? All the things we've been talking about, right? <laughs> so you, you said, so you looked, you looked very, very intent on saying something, yes. <laughs> what we were talking about. Yeah, she said what you were talking about. What I was talking about. Education. Income, okay. I'll tell you a story. When I, I, um, I think in my introduction, you're told I was a pediatrician. So one of the things that pediatricians do, we're known for, you all got it as you were growing up. It's called anticipatory guidance. Okay, it's that part of the visit where we sit there and we talk to your parents, and as you get older, we talk to you too, and we say, hmm, okay, what's going on? All right. When you're very young, we're saying, okay, well. Um, is he or she um, up and walking or still crawling now? Oh, well, yes, yeah, she's you know, started to what we call cruise, right? That means you can move now holding on to things, not by yourself. So there's one point in your life where you were a cruiser, okay? <laughs> and so we said, oh, cruiser, okay. So I say, well, um, you have stairs in the house? Yes, you have stairs, okay. So then I say, anticipatory guidance now. I'm anticipating potential risks to you as a cruiser. So I talk to your parents about making sure you stay away from the stairs, if they have gates up. I ask, are you in, um, what do you call those things that we've, we've tried to ban now? What are they called? Walk, what are they called, walkers? No, those are walkers. What are they, do we call them? These have the wheels. Do we call them walkers? God, it's been a long time, yeah. <laughs> you say, <laughs> I haven't practiced in a little while, so it's okay. So the walkers, do your kids use walkers? Okay, we, bad, horrible, bad thing, because that just, that takes a kid who wouldn't get there so fast on their own, gets them there a whole lot faster, okay? Because you put wheels on anything, it moves faster, right? We learned that a long time ago. So walkers, bad. So anticipatory guides, as you get older, then we start having those, you know, a little more, um, how shall we say, um, sensitive discussions where something we ask the parents to leave the room so I can talk to you directly. I'm not going to pick on you for this one. So talk to you directly. I'm not going to pick on anyone for this one. And you know, it's the kind of, you know, the sex, drinking, drugs kind of questions. In, and then the anticipatory guidance, you know, you want to avoid these. This is what it can do, the risks. So we anticipate those kind of things. That's what we do. All right. Well, I'm a pediatrician. I, I have a patient in front of me and, um, and I'm asking the mother, uh, who lives in one of these areas of West Philadelphia, and I say, <clears throat> uh, this is one of the standard ones, and we used to say this, you never look them in the eye when you say this, because, I don't know, because you just didn't, and you say, are there guns in the house? <laughs> and she said, I can't say what she said exactly, I think this is being filmed, but she said, yeah, there are guns in the house. And I said, oh, well, that's, oh, that's, not, that's not good, because you have a young, <laughs> you have a young child, here in this house and guns, you know, that, and I start quoting statistics about, you know, the risk to um, those who, children in houses with their guns and the likelihood that that gun is used on them. And, and she looked at me like I was out of my mind and she said to me this, do you know where I live? <laughs> and I said, um, yes ma'am, it's right here on the address. And I said, yes, I see the zip code, the number street, said, yes, I do know where you live. She said, well, then don't ask me about that. I have to keep my family safe. So for her, for her, her reality was very different than mine. I'm sitting there in that very sterile, comfortable, safe 
exam room telling her that it's unsafe to live a certain way that she's living, not knowing her reality. Where she felt, as she hears gunshots at night while she's laying her kids down to sleep, that at any time when those bullets could come through her window or someone who was shooting those bullets could come through her door. And she needs to be prepared. She felt that she needed a gun in her house to be safe. <clears throat> there are kids very much today, as we talk about, and I got a slide up here because any talk about health care and health today is not complete without an obesity slide, right? So you'll get one in just a moment. It's, it's not, you know, it's not pictures, it's not a sexy slide, it's just a graph, all right? But, but there are kids today, today, not far from here, who, yes, are overweight. Yes, they're overweight, and yes, they are unhealthy. Yes, they're at increased risk for type 2 diabetes at age 10, 12, 13 years old, ages we never saw that before. Yes, they're at risk, because every day when they come home from school, their parents make sure that while they're at work, until they get home, those kids are inside that house. I don't care how bright and sunny and beautiful it is outside, those kids are inside that house because those parents are scared to death because they know the neighborhood that they live in, that if their kids step outside that house to play ball, to ride their bike, to, to run down the street, whatever, it could be the last thing that they do. They are fearful, and so yes, their kids are inside that house all day long. And so what are they doing inside there? They're watching television. Okay? They're not active. They're not up and about. And so, yes, they're overweight. Okay? And this isn't to simplify any of this, but it's to paint a picture that's very real for many people today that we're not always thinking about. And so when you live in certain areas, there's certain things you don't do and can't do. Okay? There aren't so many parks that you can just necessarily go to and get your two miles in before you go to work in the morning or when you come home. No. It's just not practical for some folks. They can't run down the street and grab a, a fresh head of cabbage or, or a fresh, um, how's broccoli come? What do you call those? Bunch of broccoli? Bunch of broccoli? A bunch of broccoli? A bunch of broccoli, he says, yes. Uh, a bunch of broccoli. They just can't do that because they don't have stores, and you know what they get when they go down there? They can, get, they can get green beans, sure, but it's green beans in a can that has three times the salt that you would eat in a week right there in that can, okay? That's what they can get. So, so when we think about this slide and see this slide, it really clicks off a whole lot of issues there. A whole lot of issues there that we don't always think about, we didn't always think about, that say, you know what? It does matter where you live because where you live means so many things about what you have access to, what you don't, where you can go, where you can't go, when you can go there, what you can't do. Right? But again, keep in mind, as I'm going through all this, we're getting to the solutions. All this is part of the solution. There's your obesity slide. All right? There's your, there's your obesity slide. All right, so look. What does it say? Less education, less active. More education, more active. For all the kinds of reasons that we talked about, okay? Less education, you may be less likely to have a job that uh, at the location where you work has a gym. So at lunchtime you can go and hit that gym and stay nice, tight, and fit, all right? All right? Or you may not have the income, again, to live in a neighborhood where you've got the choice between whole foods, fresh foods, field foods, name it foods, fresh, you know, all that kind of stuff, where you can go and just have a bonanza of, of green and colorful vegetables and fruits. You just don't have that option. You don't have that option, all right? But we'll get to solutions. So the influences on health are real and they're broad. Foundational health, yes, we know. We've known for years, yes, we already looked at medical care, right? Give people access to health care, things will be better. Well, we found out what? That, yes, that's important, but you know what? That doesn't always work. And then once you get in there to that health care, guess what? Just because you get in the door doesn't mean you're getting the best health care. Just because you get in there doesn't mean you're getting the best health care. 
You remember the study about, it's probably been about 10, 12 years ago now that showed very clearly that women with the same symptoms of men, same symptoms as men, cardiac symptoms as men, got very different treatment. Men who came in with the same symptoms of, of a cardiovascular event were immediately sent for uh, diagnostic catheterization, and if they saw something there, then they got the interventional catheterization there in the hospital bed there. Arteries are now open, they're feeling better and recovering. Those same women with the same, those women with the same signs and symptoms were given an aspirin and told to go home. Call me back if it, if it continues. Well, some of them didn't have the chance to call back if it continues because what, was, what that was a sign and symptom of was their artery closing. And once it closed, that was it, okay? Again, documented and real, documented and real. So we know that differences exist even when you get inside there, okay? But then there's also, listen, I'm a big one for personal behavior, personal responsibility and behavior change, all right? You know who you are who take the elevator everywhere you go. <laughs> that you will spend more time walking around looking for the elevator <laughs> than it would really take you just to climb the steps. You've been, now, I'm not even going to ask for hands, but you know who you are who have been late for movies, events, for you name it, just because you either drove around looking for that parking space that got you closest to the door, and once you got inside, then looked around for the elevator and waited however long it took to get up there rather than walk, okay? We're all guilty of it at some point in time. So personal behavior is real, all right? But as we've, as we've just looked at, living and working conditions, economic and social opportunities and resources, these all play a significant and important role, all right, in addressing the issue of health disparities. Right? Improving health, health outcomes, health status, how healthy you are, and health care, health care delivery, how care is delivered. The nice thing about this also is understanding this points us directly to targets for solutions too. So remember those curves there. Remember those colored areas and those curves. Every one of, each one of those offers a nice target, nice target for interventions and solutions. So we're entering, like I said before, we're entering that, what our president called a silly season of politics, right? We're way into it now. I mean, it's, it, it's happening, okay? You hear all kinds of stuff. I won't even repeat. I, I have, a, um, I have a, a radio show. Just started a couple weeks ago, 900 AM, all right? Or www.900am, I'm sorry, yeah, www.900amwurd.com. You can get it anywhere, all right? And there's a nice phone app. You can listen to it on your phone as well. Saturday mornings, 10 to 11 a.m. I just want to bet, because someone thought I would not do that. I, I, and I usually don't do a shameless plug like that. But you know what? I got you for a few more minutes. Listen, it's a health show, all right? That's, it's relevant. I'm not just plugging something irrelevant. But where was I going with that? <laughs> so. So on, so on this show, I think I must be talking about something on the show. Oh, so, we're, so, so silly things that are happening now. So I launched the show two weeks ago, and my first topic was, which, man, send it off nicely. All kinds of phone calls coming in, because you can call in and comment, too. You can get engaged on this show. <laughs> was about HPV. Why was I talking about HPV two weeks ago? It fell right in my lap. Not Rick Perry. Well, yeah, Rick Perry. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was like right over the plate for me. And so, so this stuff is happening now. So we're in that season where, you know, the politics really comes alive. And, and really, the close cousin to politics is policy, is policy. When I give this talk to healthcare folks a lot, I ask folks to, to, to shout out to me, what's the first thing you think, first thing that comes to your mind when I say politics? So what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say politics? You're so polite, come on. First thing that comes to your mind when I say politics? Money. Lies. 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 Come on, come on, come on. Dirty. What would you say over here? Debate. Debate? There's an intellectual over here, all right. Yes, debate, okay. A little more visceral than that. Slime, what did you say? 
slander, self-serving. You guys are still so very polite. Old men, did she say? Okay. That could be problematic, too. You said something? Councilmen. Councilmen. Okay, councilmen, councilwomen, old men. <laughs> old men. All right, you guys, all right, let me tell you, some of the audiences are a little, you know, a little more base than you are. And, I'm, and, I, and, and I appreciate your, um, your, your elegance, your eloquence, and your demeanor. But some folks, I mean, they shout out all kinds of things. Rats, dirty, criminals, slime. And these are physicians. <laughs> but that's the visceral action that people have when they think about politics. And we can understand that. I mean, come on, we can understand that. We, can, we see example over and over and over again of folks who, are, who, who, who come in and tell us all these idealistic stories and, and motivate us and promise all these things, and then, then they get the power, they get our money, they get our support, and then they just use it to disgrace us, disgrace themselves, they break the law, they abuse people, it's horrible. And most men end up in jail, all right? So we see it over and over again. But the problem with that, the problem with us accepting that or limiting, limiting our view and consideration of politics to that is that we miss the point that you know what? Yeah, there's some bad stuff that goes on there. Yes, there are abuses of power, absolutely. But you know what? That's also, that is also the vehicle, the avenue, and a vehicle and avenue where real change can happen, where real differences can be made. And if we turn ourselves off to it, as the medical community has, for years and years, then we missed the opportunity to do the main thing that you're sitting in these classrooms every day for, that I went to medical school for, that we are in healthcare for, and that is to serve and help people. We take away one of our greatest opportunities and one of our greatest weapons. Now I must say, given the audience that I'm talking to, and I say this when I'm in front of the docs too, nurses have been way ahead of, <laughs> way ahead of other folks in healthcare on this. Nurses got engaged on the political and policy front while the rest of us were still saying, ew, ew, slime, nasty, dirty, right? I think nurses recognize, and I'm, and I'm not pandering to my audience because I'm not running for any office. I'm not asking, but the, and I, I say this, it's recorded and documented, I've said this before, that nurses have done that. But that said, we all got a long way to go. All have a long way to go, all right? Just a couple of healthcare signs to lighten the mood. <laughs> Sad but true. All right. Sad but true. So I've talked all this time about the problem, defining it, the examples. It's real. All right. And what I've been moving towards is solutions, because I'm about solutions. Solutions is in the name of my company. I have come to believe that we can talk all we want, there's no value to it, solutions is where it's at. So, how do you start solving this issue of health disparities? How do you eliminate health disparities, all right? If there's nothing else you take away from this time tonight together, please, please, please walk out of here with this piece of unsolicited advice from me. Get engaged. Get engaged. Get engaged. Become a part. Do something. Take action. So I start off saying, all right, what do I mean by that? Well, let's walk through this real quickly. Well, let's run through it because we're running out of time. Who are your elected officials? So how many people live around this area? All right. I'm not going to point at any one of you. Don't worry. Don't worry. But do you know who your, what can, well, first of all, do you know what county we live in? <laughs> what county do we live in? Oh, see, that's a trick question, isn't it? It probably depends on where I'm standing on campus, <laughs> right? All right, where am I right now? Delaware. I'm in Delaware County right now? Yeah. Okay, all right, so we're in Delaware County, okay. All right, I, I honestly thought we were in Montgomery County, so. <laughs> Delaware County. Do you know who your county commissioners are? Do you know how many county commissioners there are? 
Do you know one county commissioner's name? Do you know who your local uh, uh, or who your state representative is who represents this area? Do you know? Okay, some of you are nodding your head. Some of you are just avoiding eye contact with me right now. <laughs> Do you know who your state senator is? All right, let me make it a little easier for you. Do you know who your U.S. representative is? Your United States representative. Okay. All right. Do you know who your, it's getting easier as we go along. Do you know who your United States senator is? Do you know how many United States senators there are in Pennsylvania? <laughs> All right. Now you get vocal. Now you're ready to talk. All right. All right. Can you name one? Did someone say Rick Santorum? No, you didn't. Toomey and Casey. All right, Toomey and Casey. Right. To, that sounds like Toomey and Casey. That's funny. Toomey and Casey. Pat Toomey, Bob Casey. All right. Do you know who your president is? Yes. Okay, see, so it got easier as we went along. The point I'm making is you need to know who your elected officials are. Why? Because they do represent you. They do represent you. All right? And quite frankly, they need you. But more importantly, do they know who you are? Do they know who you are? Well, you're saying, I'm just, I'm just one person here. Why would they know me? Why would they need to know me? For lots of reasons. Lots of reasons. Number one. <laughs> this is entertaining, isn't it? <laughs> Number one. They need you because while they may, be, may develop an expertise in certain areas, and they often develop that by committees that they sit on, where they're given reams and reams of information and it's hard not to become an expert and know about that issue because you're fed so much information about it. They're still called to vote upon multiple issues across multiple domains that it's impossible for any one person to master. It's impossible for any one person to master. So what do they do? They look for resources. <coughs> They look for resources. Well, you know what? You could be one of those resources, okay? And what they do is they often, because they don't have time, there's so many issues and, they, and time is limited, they don't have time to always find, you know, the number one expert, known expert on a particular issue. They often reach for the person who's likely to have knowledge of that area who's most accessible and closest to them. There is no reason why you couldn't be that person. There is absolutely no reason why you couldn't be that person. So how do you become that person? Become their go-to person. Become their expert advice. Well, <clears throat> not only is it important for them, to know who, for them to know who you are, it's even more important that their staff know who you are. So how do you get to know their staff? Well, if you voted in the last election for your local representative, let's say, then you go right down to their local office, easy to find, and you go in and you introduce yourself. All right? You make sure they know who you are, what you do. You are experts. How many, how many of you went home on Thanksgiving after the first year that you started nursing school? Some of you haven't gotten there yet. I suspect, but you'll see. You go home for Thanksgiving, and everyone in your family who's ever had some illness or ailment <laughs> comes to you for diagnosis and treatment. <laughs> you are an expert now. And maybe you don't think so. Maybe you don't think you'll be the last one to believe you're an expert. But let me tell you, there are a whole lot of folks that find out, oh, you're a nurse? You're going to be a nurse? You're thinking about being a nurse? You're an expert, an instant expert to them. Capitalize on that. Use it. Believe it. And because I know you're responsible, you'll use that power wisely and for good. And you can become that expert. There's no reason why you can't or you shouldn't. And let them know what's important to you. The framework for success. If you want to improve health, and change health. It happens in all sectors. There's no one way. I just gave you one example. But it happens here in academia. It happens in government and public health infrastructure. I've been there. 
It happens in your communities. Everybody's part of a community. It happens in health, direct health care delivery systems. That's not the only place. We know that. We know that there's no hospital, there's no health system, there's no doctor's office, there's no nurse clinic, there's no health care facility that can solve all these problems in and of itself. It doesn't happen just there. It happens in business, it happens in the media, it happens everywhere. You have all these opportunities and more of targets and places to influence this health care debate, these issues of disparity, and make a difference and change them. So remember I talked about this before? I talked about targets? Well, yeah, and I'm a big believer in policy if you haven't caught on to that yet. All right, I'm a big believer. You want broad scale change? You want broad scale change? Then you look at the policies. Policies affect everything we do. You go out of here, you get in your car, you start it up, you pull out of the parking lot. There are policies that have been set that govern everything you do, where you gotta stop, which way you can turn, when you can turn, what the light has to look like, how fast you can go. Policies, policies, policies. So targets. Remember I talked about this communities, yeah, absolutely here and here, but also where people live, the kind of working conditions, economic and social opportunities, employment opportunities. You can target all those kinds of things to make a difference in terms of health disparities because we know that if people make more, have better education, it's correlated with better health. We know that better education is, cor is correlated with higher income. We know that higher income is correlated with better health. So you give people the opportunity to live in better places, to earn better wages, to get better education, then you're giving people a better chance at having a health status that is at least equivalent to yours. At least equivalent to yours. All right, so listen, so none of you are like, I'm not the political type. Okay, well, you know what? If you're a parent, if you're a sibling, all right, if you have a friend or friends, then you engage in politics because you're negotiating, you're making decisions, you're doing trade in daily life. So you know what? <laughs> you're involved in politics. You may not be elected yet, but you're involved in politics. But if you say, okay, that's not my thing, well, you know what? I'm not letting you off that easy. There's all kinds of ways you can get involved. You, are you a member of a professional organization? All right, membership and leadership? I used to do this thing with a pyramid, an upside, was it upside down pyramid? Upside down pyramid. I used, to, I used to come up with all these concepts when I was up at the state and my staff would just look at me like, oh geez, he's got another idea here. I came up with this concept this, and I put it, you know, I'd put it up on, on the whiteboard and, and then I explained this concept to him, this kind of the upside down pyramid, that right at the tip of the pyramid, right, is, you can look at this both, Two ways. There's that one voice, right? But that voice is part of an organization as you go up that, that pyramid, then that one voice becomes a much more powerful and broad voice because it is part of a larger organization of like minds pushing an agenda. All right? All right? That's one way to look at it. So committees and boards, there are all kinds. There, in this state, there are hundreds of committees and boards that you can get appointed to. You know, and that's pretty big in these times, right? Local elected roles, yeah, absolutely, run for local office. Get on the school board, get on the zoning board. Why the zoning board? Do you know that a healthcare facility can or can't be built in a certain community based on the decision of a zoning board? Man, that's power. That's power, all right? Volunteer, Volu one great way to get elected folks to know who you are is to volunteer in their campaigns before they get elected, all right? Because boy, if they ever needed you, they need you then. They need you then, all right? I mean, George Stephanopoulos started out and campaigning, and helping, volunteering, all that, and look where he is now. Where is he now? <laughs> good morning, right, yeah, good morning, America. Good morning. So, it is, it's, there's all kinds of, blog, and now today there are all kinds of things you can do. Blogging, every one of you has the mighty power of the pen or the keyboard now. And you can do it anonymously if you want, but it's powerful, powerful. Facebook, Twitter, whatever's next, all of these can be used as incredible tools, incredible tools to help address these real social issues. So, whatever you do, just make a difference.
make a difference with real intention and meaningful action. I appreciate the time you spent with me here today. I have enjoyed it tremendously. I'm here for, I think we've got time for some questions, some dialogue if you like. Um, nothing's off limits. I don't guarantee I'll answer everything, but you can ask whatever you like. But please, please, please remember, if there's nothing else you take away from this, get engaged. Thank you. Thank you.